Romans 8 gave us this great picture of God's work of salvation and how all gospel preaching will be successful. All gospel preaching will be successful and what God calls, he accomplishes. And last week I started out telling you about how the last few weeks I've been waking up to hearing a lot of noises in the neighborhood um, between a built house being built over here and another one being getting ready to be brought in over here. And the Alexis family's been hearing lots of booms and bangs and hammers and stuff like that as well, as all of our other neighbors around. And, um, and we mentioned that what happens is you, there's a lot of work that's going on and you're not seeing anything for a long time. And then all of us, and because all that work is being done in the foundation, and you have to work on that foundation, and then at some point you start seeing an edifice come up. And we started seeing that across the street this week. Because, oh, wow, that's popping up in the air now. That's, you're getting to see something, see, see where this fruition is happening. And there's a sense as the Apostle Paul is explaining salvation, rooting the church in Rome, and we shared last week of the, 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 the circumstances of him wanting to go to Spain by way of Rome and also help with this pastoral problem of this schism in the church and this cultural rift between Gentile and Jewish believers and the, the ones that have been expelled and then coming back and some of those cultural dynamics that are coming there in the life of the church. And as he's talking about that, he's explaining the gospel. And part of that is he has to go back to give us the foundations of the gospel of where this all came about. Because there's some things that there's a lot that was going on under the surface before we see something come up at the top of the surface. And from our perspective, from the evangelistic perspective, there's the presentation of the gospel and the reception of the gospel. But what Paul is saying that, yes, that sprout of that fruit of faith coming up where you can see is there at that point in time. But there was something else that was going on in the foundation all the way in eternity past. So back in Romans 8, when he gave us this golden chain of redemption, when he said about those he foreknew, he also predestined, and those he called, he'll glorify, that he's saying, okay, some of these happened in eternity's past. Some of these are happening right now in time. And there's some that are yet to happen when we're fully glorified in heaven. And we're in that already not yet. And so that foreknowledge and predestination happened in eternal life, that calling, that effectual call of God, that's when we first start seeing, and that acceptance of that calling is when we start seeing the sprout come to surface, when we see it coming out from the surface of the foundation to where we see it that from that evangelistic order, that we see someone receive Christ as their Savior. And that's happening in this space-time that we're in now. For some of you, that happened in the last couple weeks, praise God. For some of you, that might happen today. For some of you, that happened maybe a year or two years ago or 30 or 40 years ago when you received that call and accepted that call of salvation and called on the name of the Lord. And for some of you, I hope that would be today. And so we're seeing more and more of this come up. But Paul shows us more of this foundation. And as we finished off last week, he, we concluded in verse 13 of Romans 9 when he says, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Does anyone else have some questions about election besides me? You're like, I got some questions now. Thank you. You're not the first one. And Paul is going to actually answer two of those in this section we're going to look at today, one in verse 14 and one in verse 19. The first one's like, is God, wait, wait, that's not fair. And the other is like, well, how can God still condemn those that don't receive him if this is how he's working? And that's what he answers in verse 19. And we're going to consider those two this morning. So let's read in our next section, Romans chapter 9. And the theme, I said the thesis of this is verse 6, so we'll start in verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For 
Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all who are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. Not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scriptures say to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. What will you say then? Why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded? Say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory? For the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Let's take a moment, ask God to help us as we consider this. Father, you tell us, and Paul even tells us, that there are some things hard to be understood. And Lord, I believe that this passage is one of those. And so God, although we will not plumb the depths of this, I pray that the Holy Spirit would use this portion of the scriptures. Lord, you tell us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that includes Romans chapter 9. And so God, it is profitable and able to work. And so Lord, we ask that you would take this text and let it speak. And that it would accomplish the work in our lives. Give us a big vision of God in this. We pray in his name. Amen. So, some of the foundation stuff that we talked about was confusing last week. Uh, Election was the doctrine that God gave to contrast between works and calling. When he talked about how it's not by works, but by grace that we're saved, he used the doctrine of election to show us that. And he used Isaac and Jacob and Esau and Ishmael as examples from the patriarchs of this. And then we have these questions about this that came up. And, and, and Paul naturally notices this. He knows this is coming. And this is all in this uh, question about the Jews and the Jewish background and what's going on with the church. And so Romans 9 through 11 are this section in dealing with that. And it brings up this question that if God made promises, like all these promises that he's made about salvation and believing and calling and justification by faith that we've seen throughout the book of Romans... He made promises like that to the people that were literally called his chosen people. And, and since most of them are rejecting him, has, has God not kept that promise then? Or as verse 6 says, has the word of God failed? 
if God didn't keep his promise to the Jews, then the, the righteousness, his righteousness is then in, in question. And how can he be this righteous God, as Romans 4 said, that he can be justify them justly and the just and the justifier of those that are sinful. Now, ironically, um, it's funny that in Romans 4, Paul is trying to defend God for saving anyone because of they are all unrighteous. How can he do this and still be a just God? How can he be the just and the justifier? And here he's defending God of, well, how come he's not saving everyone then? And, and this is so it's kind of on there. So has God failed the Jews then? And the question is, no, he didn't promise righteousness to all, rather to the ones that were Abraham's true children that believed the promise. And those questions came up, and this is a very God-centered practice a passage that's pointing us to this big view of God. And it kind of flies in the face of the customary way that we're often thinking about salvation, that we're often thinking that we are the center of the universe and the object and end all of everything related to salvation. And this passage is really showing us, no, all this was to show off God's glory in the end, um, that there was something more than us in the picture, that contrary to the, 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 what's in our nature, the world doesn't revolve around us. And this is God-centered here, and that we I also emphasize that we need to make sure that we're taking Romans 9, 10, and 11 together so that we're not on one extreme or the other. And we're not just focusing on the sovereignty of God and election in Romans 9, and not just focusing on human responsibility and belief in the preaching of the word in Romans 10. Both are important. And I, I, we're, we're taking both of them, as we mentioned at the end of the service last week, that we want to, as Spurgeon quoted, preach the doctrines of the Puritans with the fire of the Wesleys and, and bring that together. And then... Um, and that, but that the source of all this, the end of this, when we come to Romans 11, Paul puts this human responsibility and sovereign election together, not in theological systems and conflicts, but in worship in, in Romans 11.33. This, it results in this doxology of the depth and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable and unscrutable are his ways, who has known the mind of the Lord, who has been his counselor, who has given a gift to him, for from him and through him and to him are all things, including our salvation. To him be glory forever. Amen. And so the end is, is worship. And before entering into these questions, Paul gave us in verses 1 to 5 his heart for souls. And so we saw that we don't just want to have Paul's theology of Romans 9, 10, and 11, but Paul's heart for burden for souls that we see in Romans 1 to 5. And that every Christian ought to have a burden for souls. I wonder, how's your sweetheart list going? You got those five people you're praying for? You know, someone you're, you, 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 who's your one that you're thinking of, that I'm praying for this person to be saved and that they're going to take steps of building a relationship or redemptive relationship with them. And so we're, we're thinking there. So, so kind of the syllogism is if A, God promised this, and B, it's being fulfilled through the Gentiles, then C, God lied. Verse, is, verse 6 is the word of God failed. But Paul is actually saying no. A is being fulfilled through B, the Gentiles being things, so therefore God is right. And they're questioning God's lo Paul's loyalty and patriotism, but he's saying, no, I want them to be saved. I have a burden for them. Has God's word failed? And the first, that was what we looked at last week, and the answer is no, because God is working out his sovereign purpose through history. And then it was through the promise that the, the gospel wasn't through descent. It wasn't just being a child of Abraham. Because Ishmael wasn't, was a child of Abraham, and that wasn't. And it wasn't, uh, it was through promise, not just how, what you merited. So it wasn't Isaac or uh, um, Jacob and Esau, because it wasn't birth order, because Jacob was younger. It wasn't they having the same father, or even the same mother, or even the same time. They're twins. But God, and it, and it wasn't because of how they acted, because God says to them ahead of time, before they're born, before they do evil or bad, that the, young, the older will serve the younger, that it was this promise given. And we saw there that there's Esau's and there's Jacob's now. There's those that forsake the birthright, the promise, for the pleasures of this world, as he 
chose a bowl of soup over his inheritance. Um, and although Jacob was messed up on a supplanter, that he did cling to the promise, and that our salvation is clinging to the promise that if we'll repent of our sins and believe on Christ as our Savior, he will save us. And it is only through the promise that we believe by faith. So true Israel was those who recognized and embraced Jesus as the Messiah. Those that don't embrace Jesus were never true Jews in the first place. And so what about the Jews? Well, you can't say that the Jewish rejection of Israel is a sign or proof that God loses some of his sons and daughters along the way. No, he keeps them. The ones who rejected him were never the his to begin with. There are Jews that have not followed Jesus Messiah, and that doesn't contradict God's promise. God's always been about this plan. And the purpose of it, verse 11, was in order that, he even told us why he's doing this, that the purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. And it's not by works. It's based upon this calling. This calling. And so we left off with that. And the question comes up, and Paul raises up another question that we've all considered when we think about this. Well, is this right? Is this fair? In verse 14, is there injustice on God's part? And Paul says, no way. Absolutely not. By no means. God forbid, depending on which translation you're looking at. A couple of things here about this. Some of us, when we hear this doctrine being presented, we, it, it's, we don't like it. because, And some of that is because it's been misrepresented and mispresented by some people that are all about this doctrine that frankly come across as jerks, you know? And, um, and I want you to know that I've felt that way a long time too. <laughs> that the people that were all about this, I'm like, those guys are just like pompous and arrogant and jerks and they don't love people. And, um, and as much as, um, as we don't like it, the question we're, we have to answer is the most important question is all. Is not, do we like the people that, or the theologians that this doctrine is most known for or connected to or something like that? But the question we have to ask is, does the Bible teach it? That's what we have to ask. And I think if we're going to be honest, election is the Bible's teaching, not man's teaching. That this, this doctrine did not come up in the Middle Ages or the early part of the Reformation. Um, this is in the Bible. You can go to Ephesians 1, Romans 8 and 9, John chapter 1, 1 John, 2 Peter. Passages in the Old Testament. You can go to Acts. You can go to um, many of the epistles and see this um, doctrine put out there for us. And so the question is, God unfair in how he distributes justice and, and, and so I, the first thing, the fact that this question comes up in verse 14, you, you guys have been around me long enough to know one of the ways we want to study the Bible is when we see something in the Bible, we ask, well, why is this here? And the, so the first thing I would say is the fact that that question's there, I think shows us that we were on the right track in how we interpreted verses 6 to 13 and applying them to salvation. I mentioned before that there are some that would say, well, this only applies to God's choice of nations and nationalities, not individual people. But the fact that Paul then brings up and says about this and about these individuals of Jacob and Esau shows us that he is talking about this. Paul does, does not base it. And, then, and if 
we would say, well, it's all about foreknowledge and about God seeing how someone's going to respond in the future and then making his call. Well, then why would he be so clear to say it was actually before Jacob and Esau were even born that God said this, before they did good or evil? He said, well, why didn't you bring that up? And if, this was the, if that was the point, then this is the spot for Paul to say, hey, remember, I'm making sure I'm telling you this. I'm basing this on what I see in the future that these people are going to do and how they're going to respond to a message. But no, Paul doesn't even mention that. In fact, he just doubles down on God's freedom to have mercy on whoever he wants to have mercy on. He goes into the potter's freedom. But the potter has freedom to mold clay however he wishes. And so, did God do something wrong by showing mercy on Jacob and not on Esau? No, by definition, God always does what is right. And there are some Old Testament examples of this. In fact, what he's doing is he's quoting from Exodus 33. If you want to go with me, Exodus 33, verse 9, you'll, 19, you'll see this when it says, And he said, I will make all goodness pass before me and will proclaim before your name the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And brothers and sisters, he's quoting this. He's affirming that it's not based upon human will, but upon God's mercy. So brothers and sisters, this is not a passage to, to talk about how people that aren't coming to know salvation. This is an evangelistic thrust to say, God wants to have mercy on you and be saved. And it's not dependent on your works. It's dependent on God's mercy so, he, so as he says in verse 18, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills and hardens whomever he wills. It's not dependent on us. It's dependent on the one who has mercy. Verse 16, so then it depends not on human will or on exertion, but on God who has mercy. Salvation is of the Lord. So it's mercy, not justice. So we say, well, is that fair? Is that just? How can be God just to do that? Well, um, this, is a, this is a hard, I want to share a quote with you guys about this I skipped earlier. Uh, Warren Wearsby says this. He says that, um, he said, try to explain re election and you may lose your mind. But explain it away and you will lose your soul. Try to explain an election and you may lose your mind, but explain it away and you will lose your soul. It's Warren Wiersbe. And so what he's saying is, if you explain this away by some other means, you don't have salvation. Remember Spurgeon quote last week when Spurgeon says, I believe in this because there's no way I would have chosen God if he hadn't chosen me. I was so messed up. I, he had to save me. So, so um, it comes to this, and so he gives us these examples is th that salvation is mercy, not justice. And I am so glad, and you should be so glad, that salvation is based upon mercy and not justice. You know why? Because if I got what I just deserve, I'd be in hell. Election has always been a matter of grace. Here's Warren Wiersbe again. If God acted only on the basis of righteousness... Nobody would ever be saved. The de definition of mercy precludes an obligation. Is God obligated to save us? No. Mercy is something that by definition is we don't deserve. That's mercy. I don't deserve it. Getting something I don't deserve. I, I deserve hell. Salvation is mercy. God doesn't owe it to me. So I want you to get this. God doesn't owe any of us salvation, but he offers all of us salvation. Like this is, this is the, the gospel is this offer of mercy. He doesn't owe it to us. If we got what we deserve, we split hell wide open. I love it when someone says, hey, how you doing? Goes, Better than I deserve. Why? Because if I got what I deserve, I'd be in hell. And if you got what you deserve, you'd be in hell. It's about mercy. If God doesn't owe anyone mercy, how can we say that he's unfair to, and how he shows it to anybody? 
John Stott summarizes it and says this way, Paul's way of defending God's justice is to proclaim his mercy. That, that may seem backward to us, but it is not. Paul is indicating that the question itself is misconceived because the basis on which God deals savingly with sinners is not justice, but mercy. So if someone says, is there injustice with God? That's basically they're saying, are you trying to say that God owes us all? Are you, are you saying God owes us salvation? Well, you're like, no, God doesn't owe me salvation. If God doesn't owe us salvation, then he's free to give it to whomever he wants. Where and where's be again? God is holy and just to punish sin, but God is loving and desires to save sinners. If everybody is saved, it would deny his holiness. But if everybody is lost, it would deny his love. The solution to the problem is God's sovereign election. I'm going to read that again. That's where and where's be again. God is holy and just to punish sin, but God is loving and desires to save sinners. If everybody is saved, it would deny his holiness. But if everybody is lost, it would deny his love. The solution to the problem is God's sovereign election. Going all the way back to the Council of Dort, it said that God would have done us no injustice by leaving all of us to perish. God could have let all of us perish. The wages of sin is death. God would be right and holy to let every sinner receive the just payment of their sin. So the question, is that fair? Paul comes and says, you don't want to talk about things being fair. Because if it was fair, none of y'all are getting salvation. And Paul's not getting it. And Jason's not getting it. We don't want to talk about what's fair. Fair would be to leave us all in condemnation. The condemnation that we chose, both by our nature that we're sinners and by our choices to continue to act as sinners. We are saved by grace alone. And we realize in verse 16 that we had nothing to do with this. We had no inner goodness, inner deservingness that God would save us. It's all mercy. None of us deserve salvation any more than anybody else. This doctrine should humble you. It shouldn't make you arrogant. No one deserves this salvation more than anyone else. I mean, I mean, and we, I mentioned this last week that many of you can think of folks you're like, okay, I, I sat in the same Sunday school class with that other kid that was nine years old. Why did I believe this and he didn't? Why did, why did, when I went to youth camp and I believed on Jesus and whenever that calling and you believed on Christ and there were others that maybe were there that felt that same tug and didn't receive it, what makes, was there anything, what made you be saved and them not? And it's not because of anything good in you. It's pure grace that God saved us. Saved by grace alone, this is all I plead. Jesus died for all mankind, and Jesus died for me, as the old gospel hymn says. So he gives us this example of Pharaoh and Moses. Pharaoh and Moses are both grow up Egyptians. Both are murderers. Pharaoh and Moses, both are murderers. Both of them see God work, doing miracles, parting seas, sending plagues. Moses believes Pharaoh hardens his heart. He gives us this example of, of Pharaoh being a vessel fitted for dishonor. And it comes to verse 19, the second question then. Is God unjust in holding us accountable for rejecting him? So it says, what you, we, shall we say then, why does God still find fault? Or who can resist his will? And so the, we have to answer the question there about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. So if you go back to Exodus chapter 7 and through verse and chapter through chapter 7 and chapter 14 of Exodus, you will see at least 15 times where it talks about Pharaoh's heart being hard. And a lot of them you will see where it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then a lot you will see that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There are some people that like to say, well, the first five plagues, Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and then the next five plagues. It, 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 it was God that hardened his heart. But, but back in chapter 4, God said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. So which is true? God hardened Pharaoh's heart or Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart? 
Yes, both are true. And, and, and there's this unique thing that God is so sovereign that he can work in people's lives and move about in them so that they are making totally free choices on their own, yet God is sovereign over it. And don't ask me to explain that. Okay, there are mysteries beyond the human mind is able to, to understand. But, but both are true. And so, but what I want to say about this is this, that who rejected whom first? Who rejected whom first? I think that's right grammar, right? Um, who rejected whom? Is that right? Okay, all right, I got head nods more on this side. Vote, yay, nay. Okay, all right. My mom might be watching this. She taught English, so I got to make sure I get that right. Um, who rejected whom first? Some will say it was Pharaoh's hardening, and some will say it was God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And I think it's the nature that, that God, there was a predisposition of Pharaoh to harden his heart through his own choices, being consistent with his own nature, and God is confirming that. Even John MacArthur in the MacArthur Study Bible said it this way. He says, this does not mean that God actively created unbelief or some other evil in Pharaoh's heart. Because James said, God is not the author of evil. But rather, that he withdrew all divine influences that ordinarily acted to restrain to sin and allowed Pharaoh's wicked heart to pursue its own sin unabated. Basically, this is what Paul already told us in Romans chapter 1 when he talks about those that are unrighteous and they follow their unrighteous and he turns them over to their own way to a reprobate mind. That the worst punishment that God can do for any of us is say, okay. Or as the psalm it says, he gave them their desire and sent leanness to their soul. The, sometimes the worst thing that God can do is give you what you want. That, that there was a point that Pharaoh is hardening his heart, he's thinking, and the God's okay, and leaves him to that way, that it's God hardening his heart. And so there's a sense there that God is not condemning anyone who it hasn't rightly already condemned themselves. Tim Keller said it, that when God hardens someone, he doesn't create the hardness. He simply allows the person to go his or her own way. John Stott said it this way, The wonder is not that some are saved and others are not, but that anybody is saved at all. For we deserve nothing at God's hand but judgment. If we receive what we deserve, which is judgment, or if we receive what we do not deserve, which is mercy, in neither case is God unjust. If, therefore, anyone is lost, the blame is theirs. But if anyone is saved, the credit is God's. This contains a mystery which our present knowledge cannot solve, but it is consistent with the scripture, history, and experience. So what he's saying again is this. If anyone sit lost and goes to hell, they can't blame it on God. It's your own fault. But if anyone's saved, it's because of God's grace that he saved you. Um, I'll give an illustration from this. D. James Kennedy is pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church and the founder of Evangelism Explosion. So if any of you have ever heard the question or used the question when you were sharing uh, the gospel, if you were to die today, where would you go? If you were to stand before God and he was to say, why should I let you come into heaven? What would you say? Those two diagnostic questions kind of came about with EE, with Evangelism Explosion and training people how to share the gospel. Well, D. James Kennedy shares this story I've heard that... Um, there are five friends, and they're all planning to rob a bank. We're going to go rob a bank. Let's go rob a bank. And you're with those friends, and you're saying, guys, this is a bad idea. Don't do this. Wrong. Don't do it. And you plead, don't do it. Don't go rob the bank. And, and they're ready to go. So these five guys are getting ready to, I think they started a burger joint after they got the money from the bank. I'm joking. I don't know. I just said five guys, and it was five guys. Okay. Anyway, I had a burger last night, and Okay. Um, so, so as these five guys are headed out to rob the bank, you grab one of your friends. He grabs one of his friends and says, don't go. No, this is stupid. You're going to ruin your life. And he wrestles and holds him to the ground. He always kicks it. Let me go. And the other four guys take off and they go rob the bank. In the midst of the robbery, they end up shooting and killing two civilians. They're all caught and they're all sentenced. 
But the one man who was not involved in the robbery goes free because he wasn't there. He didn't commit the crime. He, he goes free. And so he says, Kennedy says, now I ask you the question, whose fault was it that the other men were arrested and sentenced? Can they blame you? And this other man for, is walking around free. Can he say, because my heart was so good, I resisted the temptation? No. Can those guys come and say, we're in prison because you didn't wrestle all of us. You only wrestled that one guy. Can he say, well, I did it because I was, I was willing to get wrestled and held back and not get in the car? No. The guy can say, I'm so thankful you held me back and didn't let me get in that car. And the other guys are in prison because they rightfully are in prison because they committed a crime. And so the only reason that he is free is because of the person who restrained him. And so it is that those who go to hell have no one to blame but themselves. And those who go to heaven have no one to praise but Jesus Christ. And thus we see that salvation is by grace from beginning to the end. Or C.S. Lewis has a quote about this. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Hell is always a door that is locked from the inside. Hell is always a door that is locked first from the inside. So those who go to hell have no one to blame but themselves. And those that go to heaven have no one to praise but Jesus Christ. So then there's this question, is God's choice to save son inconsistent with his goodness? And that's what we see in verse 20. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God. Basically, he says, you remember your status. Remember that you are not smarter than God, and that our response is as Psalm 115, verse 3 says, our God is in the heaven and does what he pleases. That the, molder, the, 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 the creation doesn't say to the creator, that God is the one. Are we smarter than God that we could figure out a better way to save some, to save his people? Do we have a better plan than him? I doubt it. Let's trust him. The ultimate end that God pursues in all things is his glory, including our own salvation. And we might not be used to thinking that way, but that's exactly the way it is. So salvation is something that God owes none of us, but salvation is something that God offers to all of us. If we reject the gospel, it's all on us. If we receive the gospel, it's all on him. And one day, he, the day that if we continue to reject him, one day he may let go and stop calling. That there's maybe someone here and God's been working on your heart to receive Christ as your Savior. And you've said, okay, maybe one day or maybe I'll believe that. And Jesus, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, old oh, sinners, come home. But there's going to come a time that he stops calling. And you could call that when he hardens your heart. And that there's a time that you rejected it for the last time. And that's why the Bible is so clear in multiple sections when it says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Today is the day of salvation. So Jesus is calling. Would you receive him? God's sovereignty in our salvation should produce a humility in us, not a pride. But God's salvation being all of his grace should give us boldness to share the gospel with others. We should not try to guess who the good... Sharing the gospel is not marketing. When you market, you look for a target audience. Who's going to be the most acceptable? Who would be the best prospect for the, for, for the, for the target? That's why as soon as I turn 40, I start getting a lot of ads that I didn't used to get ads for. I'm like, wait, what, what, how did they know my knee hurts? You know, it's like they, they're just guessing. You're at that age where things start creaking and cracking, right? You know, I mean, it's like we look, they, they're looking, someone's out there looking for a target audience of this, right? And we kind of do the same thing. We look at our neighbors, we look at our family members, like, oh, yeah, he's never going to get saved. Well, they might be a good prospect. You know, they're kind of good people, and maybe they might be interested in getting saved. And we kind of do that. But what this doctrine teaches us is that, no. That God's going to have mercy on whoever he has mercy on. We shouldn't try to guess who's in, any, meeny, minor, mo, you know, duck, duck, damned, or whatever like that. Think who's in, who's out. No. 
we give the gospel to everyone. And I remember one time, I want to encourage you as we're thinking about who's your one, to think about who is the person, I want you to think about this, who is the person that is the least like, likely person you know to get saved? I want you to think about them. You can think politically on the big national level, but I'm talking about someone in your sphere, your family, your friends, your, your street where you live. I remember doing this one time in a prayer meeting. And uh, it wasn't here. It was in West Virginia. And, and we said, who is the person that's farthest from God that you think that person is never going to get saved? And there's this guy that I'm friends with. And... Uh, I'm going to call him Joe. His name's not Joe, but his name, for our purposes, his name's Joe. So Joe is known as being a shyster in our little town. He's in real estate. He's a crook. Everybody knows it. I ride with Joe in his truck. He's got the breathalyzer installed because he's had so many DUIs. I mean, he's just, he's a fun guy to be around, and obviously, you know, he's got, but he's got to, I mean, it's cooked up. In order for him to drive, he has to puff on the thing, that does his test. Um, I go to the gas station. It wasn't Wawa. It was Sheets. I still think Sheets and Wawa are the same thing. Pray for me. Um, my kids think that's heresy. Uh, um, uh, and, you know, Sheets has the thing, like other places, you get so many coffees, you get one free. You know, so I see this guy regularly getting coffee. Hey, how you doing? Da, 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 da. We become friends on Facebook. Uh, he messaged me some questions about eternity, God, what's going on. He's got kids by different girls, and uh, he's just a... So I'm thinking he is the last person in the world that's ever going to get saved. But I pray for him to get saved. I had some other people praying for him to get saved. You know what? Years later... I wasn't living there. We're still buddies on Facebook. I see him in church, posting pictures of him in church, how he's come to know Christ as his Savior, married a Christian girl. Not perfect, still struggling with stuff, but trying to get his act straight. And you know what I uh, had to think? So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Who is the least likely person that you could think of that would be saved? And would you pray for them? You might say, well, yeah, Jason, you've been talking about inviting somebody. I don't know this person. They never come. Will you pray about that? You know, God can, God can save whoever he wants. You know, he, can, he will save. He will have mercy on who has mercy. And you don't know. This doctrine should give you boldness. To share the gospel. That it's not dependent on you. It's not dependent on the way you share it. Whether you pitch it just right. Whether the, your flyer you handed from the church had the perfect font. And Pastor Jason didn't miss any commas in that flyer he made for the thing. You know. It's not dependent on grammar. It's dependent on God doing the work. And it should produce in us this idea of, of glorifying God. Ourselves. And so. God is calling. There are different callings in the Bible, the internal and the external. And the calling he offers to you is salvation. Have you received this gift of salvation? Let's bow our heads and pray.